Hello and welcome to the video. Today we're going to be talking about How We Learn by Benedict Carey. This book is going to be perfect for you if you are looking to get more out of the books that you read, if you're looking to get more out of videos similar to this one, maybe you're taking a course or some sort of accreditation that you need to study for, this book is going to be perfect for you. And before we get into the book, why don't we talk a little bit about its author, Benedict Carey. So Benedict Carey is an award-winning science writer for the New York Times. If you know anything about the New York Times, that's obviously some pretty high praise to be working with the New York Times. He's got a bachelor's degree in math and a master's in journalism, and he's written about health and science for over 25 years. So he obviously knows what he's talking about. A little bit about the book, How We Learn. The quote that I pulled out of the book that I think really sums up the book in a good fashion is this, and it sums up what we'll be learning in this book in a very nice and neat fashion. It says that the treasure at the end of the rainbow is not necessarily brilliance. Brilliance is a fine aspiration, and Godspeed to those who have the genes, drive, luck, and connections to win that lottery. But shooting for a goal so vague puts a person at risk of worshipping an ideal and missing the target. So you can see already that the book is not going to help us search for brilliance necessarily. He talks about how a lot of brilliance goes in to having the genes drive luck and connections to win that lottery. Very interesting. But it's going to be more so for the people like me and you who might not have the genes drive luck and connections to win the lottery of brilliance or to seek after being the number one person in a specific field on some certain topic. A lot of that stuff does turn down to be luck. But he says, no, this book is something that is, at once, more humble and more grand. How to integrate the exotica of new subjects into daily life in a way that makes them seep under our skin. So he talks about how when we learn something new, it's going to be a lot about how to make it seep under our skin and apply it to our daily lives, which is a lot of what we talk about on this channel. He says, how to make learning more a part of a living and less an isolated chore. We will mine the latest science to unearth the tools necessary to pull this off and to do so without feeling burdened or oppressed. And we will show that some of what's been taught, some of what we've been taught to think of as our worst enemies, laziness, ignorance, and distraction can also work in our favor. And those last couple of sentences, those feel so great, right? How many of us are feeling burdened or oppressed when we have to go in and learn something new? Or if we're trying to accomplish something and we need to study in order to accomplish that, how many of us are burdened by those enemies of laziness, ignorance, and distraction? I can bet that a lot of us are putting our hands up right now. So this book is really an exploration of the latest research on how we learn. It's packed with a lot of research studies, some of which are challenging the ideas that we currently hold about learning. Now this mind map has broken down some of the best techniques from the book. And this is a little bit different than some of my other videos because I've also added quite a bit of my own process for learning because I've used this book to modify my approach with these mind maps. And that being said, I'm obviously not a genius. And this is definitely a work in process. Progress. So find your own way to do things. But I'll give you what Benedict is talking about and I'll give you a little bit about my way of doing things as well. Now if you're interested in more of the why or how, I recommend you pick up the book. And I'll show you how I use the techniques in making these videos. So I'm going to talk more about the actions and a little bit less about the why and the how of the book. But if you're interested, go ahead and pick it up. I definitely recommend it. Now the first big idea, the first point that I wanted to talk about is distributed learning. Now this is something that is definitely going to challenge some beliefs that a lot of us have. It's really a technique, and this is what Benedict has to say about it. He says, the technique is called distributed learning, or more commonly, the spacing effect. So you might have heard of it called the spacing effect before. People learn at least as much and retain it much longer when they distribute or space their study time than when they concentrate it. Mom's right. It's better to do a little today and a little tomorrow rather than everything all at once. Not just better, but a lot better. Distributed learning in certain situations, can double the amount we remember later on. So that's a pretty compelling why, right? We can double the amount that we remember later on. And especially if we're learning something that doesn't just require us to regurgitate the facts, 
such as some of the ideas in this book that we actually need to integrate into our lives, it's very, very important that we can double the amount that we remember later, especially if we have a certain only a certain amount of time to work on a certain subject. So here we're going to talk about him actually explaining how it works, giving us kind of a, an analogy. He says that I like to think of the spacing effect in terms of lawn care in Los Angeles. L.A. is a city with a, coast, with a coastal desert climate and a cultural commitment to this pristine lawn. I learned while living there for seven years to, dep- to maintain one of those. It's far more effective to water for 30 minutes three times a week than for an hour and a half once a week. Flooding the lawn makes it look slightly more lush the next day, but that emerald gloss fades. Sure enough, a healthy dose every couple of days, and you can look your neighbors in the eye while using the same amount of water or even less. He goes on to say that the same goes for distributed learning. You're not spending any more time. You're not working any harder, but you remember longer. And going a little bit deeper into this analogy, he talks about how the next day, the lawn can look a little bit more lush. And that's the same thing with non-distributed learning, concentrated learning. As soon as you test yourself right after a long concentration session, or maybe even the next day, you might remember more because you spent three hours in a concentrated time than if you spent one hour. And you might remember more that first day. But that second day and third day are what's going to continually stamp it into your mind so that you remember it for much, much longer. So we'll talk a little bit about the spacing effect, which is, in essence is distributed learning. The basic idea behind it is, is this. Let's say you're planning on studying for three hours. You're much better to break it into break that three hours into three one-hour chunks than to do three hours all at once. And we'll talk a little bit about why. It says, this gives your brain a chance to do a little forgetting. That's interesting. That's one of the things that we talked about in the introduction. When you show show up to study for the session, it'll be just a little bit harder to bring to mind what you studied before, what you studied last time, that last hour that you did. Because it, it, it's a little bit more effort, your brain will wire new pathways to remember how to do it again and again, making it easier to, to recall the next time you need to. So you're much, much better to continually bring up this topic that you're trying to study rather than trying to just concentrate it on it hard for three hours at a time because it's going to be more difficult. And this is going to come up quite a bit. We're going to actually find ways to make studying more difficult for your brain rather than to make it easier because making it more difficult cuts the amount of time that you need to do. And it also increases the amount of things that you remember. So now I'll talk a little bit about how I use this in the mind maps. So days that I create the mind maps, I will set an egg timer that you've heard me talk about probably before for 30 minutes. And when that goes off, I stop, I get up, and I try to relax or do something completely different than what I'm doing, either studying the book or creating the mind map. So I keep doing that until the book is finished, and then I take a short break and I try and forget everything I can about the book by focusing on something different. So quite often I'll go for a walk or potentially I'll just go outside, do some squats, I'll do some things that my girlfriend has asked me to do around the house for the day, just you know, five, ten minute tasks, etc., And after that, I do the mind map from the notes I've created, right? I really try and take out only these quotes that I've highlighted, and then I try and create my own. This is another interesting thing as well that we might not talk about, but I try and create my own system, everything underneath the quotes. So I just pull out the quotes, and I try and pull out what the quotes actually mean in context of the entire book. And then I'll take a one-hour walk before I actually do the video. And this is another big point that we'll talk about a little bit later. But this is where I do a productive meditation, like Cal Newport talks about in his book, Deep Work. I did a mind map on that, and I'll leave the link down below if you wish to view it. I really recommend that book. What I do is I will walk for an hour, and I'll think of the mind map and how I have it structured on the page in my head. And I'll try and actually do this presentation one hour before I do the presentation while I'm taking my dog for a walk. That has been immensely helpful, and it allows me to get my ideas out much more clearly and succinctly. So this creates a bunch of small breaks, just on this micro level um, with my learning, right? Some micro breaks. Uh, so my brain to have the opportunity to forget what I had learned. So I have to force myself to pull it back up again. 
and making sure that I will remember it for the longer term, which after all, it's very important. I can read all these books, but if I forget them right away, then it was just wasted time. And that's one of the ways that I've used and I've implemented to try and help myself remember some of the stuff in these mind maps. And we'll talk about one more, which is the fluency illusion. And the, this is kind of the reason why distrib distributed learning and mixing it up, sleeping and naps, and can you teach it is so important because we have this illusion of fluency and quote unquote getting it. So this is what he says in the book. He says, let's recall the Bjork's desirable difficulty principle. The harder your brain has to work to dig out the memory, the greater the increase in learning, right? We talked about that before. The harder your brain has to work to dig out a memory, the greater the increase in learning, retrieval, and storage strength. He goes on to say that fluency then is the flip side of equation, of the equation. The easier it is to call a fact to mind, the smaller the increase in learning. Repeating facts right after you've studied them gives you nothing, no added memory benefit. Very, very interesting. Repeating the facts directly after you've memorized them or put them to memory gives you no added memory benefit. The fluency illusion is the primary culprit in below average test performances. Not anxiety, not stupidity, not unfairness or bad luck. Fluency. So you can see that fluency being the flip side of the equation, right? Desirable difficulty is what we're talking about here. <clears throat> this is what we're doing when we're studying. We're trying to make it desirably difficult. And then when we're on the test, because we've done so many desirably difficult things, then we'll be able to be fluent because we won't be learning anything new. Those facts will be at the top of our mind because we've taught them to be at the top of our mind. And he talks about here that the fluency illusion is the primary culprit in below average test scores. So a lot of people think that because of anxiety, you don't do as well on the test as you do in your practice tests. But what's actually happening is you're doing your practice tests directly after you've done your studying. So there's a lot more fluency there. And that's what the fluency illusion is because you are basically repeating the facts right after you've studied them and they haven't had, you haven't had a chance to forget them. So the best way to overcome this illusion and improve our testing skills is conveniently an effective study technique in its own right. The technique is testing itself. And he says, yes, I am aware of how circular this logic appears. Better testing through testing. Don't be fooled. There's a lot more to self-examination then you know. A test is not only a measurement tool, it alters what we remember and changes how we subsequently organize that knowledge in our minds. And it does so in ways that greatly improve later performance. So quote unquote, getting it. Um, do you know that feeling when you're reading or studying of getting it? So that's perceived fluency, right? So you're reading something and you're studying it and then you're testing yourself. Maybe you're doing some sort of a practice test or something like that directly after you feel like you're getting it and that's perceived fluency because you studied and then you immediately went right to the test and it seems like you know exactly what you're talking about but really you haven't had enough of that desirable difficulty in order to actually be fluent it's just an illusion of fluency and it feels great but he says it's very dangerous because repeating something directly after learning it is easy but remembering it long enough to put it on paper when you're tested is not. Or integrate it into your daily life is much, much different. And to overcome the fluency illusion, this is what you would do. You would want to create enough desirable difficulty until you are actually fluent and you don't have the fluency illusion. So the best way you can do this to test yourself, um, he, says, he says here that uh, a test is not only a measurement tool, it alters what we remember and changes how we subsequently organize that knowledge in our mind. And that's what I was talking about before, where you're creating these new pathways. Every time you have to try and remember something, it gets easier and easier and easier to remember it. And that's what we want to do, continue to force ourselves to remember it over and over and over again. So the ways that you can test yourself are simply this. Close the book, video course, and ask yourself, what was that chapter, video, or lesson about? And then the second step, see if you can actively retrieve the information you're learning actively retrieve the information you're learning. This will pop the fluency bubble if you don't really know it. 
So let's say, for example, <clears throat> you're studying a certain topic. Let's say you're studying this book, for example. And then two hours go by, five hours go by, six hours go by, and you're doing some other things. And you go back and you try and retrieve that information that you've been learning. Can you do it? And if you can't, then that's going to pop your fluency bubble. You're going to realize, oh, I didn't actually learn, remember, and memorize the things that were happening in that video. And that's what he calls the fluency bubble. And it can be quite uncomfortable because you can realize that something that you thought you were fluent in because you watched a one-hour video on it, you don't actually remember very much because you haven't done enough things to create desirable difficulty. You simply just passively took it in and because of the fluency illusion, you felt like you were fluent in, in that topic. So I wanted to talk about a little bit more about how I do this. So I create this desirable difficulty by trying to recite my entire mind map video in my head on my one hour walk before I even do the video. This makes sure I really know the material and won't forget something halfway through the video. But this is incredibly difficult. It was incredibly difficult. I remember the first few times I would get the introduction out of the way in my head and then the first point and then I would forget all the subsequent points because I wasn't actually trying to remember these things in my head. I was just trying to get them out on the paper. And once they were on the paper, I would think, okay, now I am fluent in it. And that's just simply not the case. And sometimes it still is. But that's only if I don't spend enough time with the material or if it's a brand new concept for me. So this one was relatively easy because a lot of these concepts are something that I have already been doing just because I felt like they were best practices as I was learning how to do these mind maps. So it was a little bit easier. But something more difficult, something more technical might take me a little while longer to remember. And I would have to create more desirable difficulty in order to actually become fluent in whatever the topic is. And obviously it's very important to be fluent in this video because I don't have a script. All I have is these points. And if I don't remember what I meant by writing out one of these points, I will end up being stuck in the middle of the video. And I try not to do any cuts, so I could be 45 minutes in. If I don't remember what the creative projects is going to be about, and I haven't created desirable difficulty in order to be able to pull out what I, what I meant in each topic, then I would be stuck 45 minutes in and trying not to do any cuts. I might have to start the video all over again. So it's very, very important to create real fluency and not the illusion of fluency. So another tip kind of, you know, another tip or trick that we could do here to try and create just a little bit more desirable difficulty is mixing it up. So he says that it's not the, it's not that repetitive practice is bad. We all need a certain amount of it to become familiar with any new skill or material. So repetitive practice would be, uh, for example, reading a chapter over again or reciting certain facts or fill in the blanks and et cetera which is good for certain certain things. Like he says, we need a certain amount of it to become familiar with any new skill or material. But repetition creates a powerful illusion. Skills improve quickly and then plateau. So, for example, this is the exact same thing. It's a, this powerful illusion, this illusion of fluency. If you only have to remember the exact points the way that you have them written down on the page, it'll be much easier to remember that than it will be when you have to go into some sort of a test or to even implement it into your daily life and the points are not in the same order. If you don't create mi this mix it up type thing, you're going to easily forget it because you don't really even know it. It's just another illusion of fluency. By contrast, varied practice produces a slower but apparent rate of improvement in each single practice session, but a greater accumulation of skill and learning over time. So you can see it, it, if you vary your practice up, like we'll talk about in a little bit here, that it's going to be a lot longer until you feel like you're getting fluent with the skill, but it's more accumulative and it's more incremental, I would say. In the long term, repeated practice on one skill slows us down. So if you have to memorize more than one thing at a time, like say, for example, you have two different tests coming up, try to switch back and forth in between the two. And that would be one way that you could use this mix it up principle. So don't practice one at a time. This is another way to create a level of desirable difficulty in your studying techniques. If you're switching from one topic to another topic, it's going to be easy for you to forget in between, and it won't be memorization. It will be real fluency that you're testing when you go back and test yourself. Are you trying to learn more than one thing at a time? Here are a couple of tips that you can do. Don't focus on the su one subject until completion. Switch between the subjects. And here's a little bit of a bonus point. If we think about the Bateson levels of learning, which I've talked about in some other videos, 
what you can do is you can try to look for the what if level of learning. And what if is essentially applying a certain piece of knowledge or piece of information on several different pieces of information. So say for example, you're reading a book about health and fitness and it talks about how there's certain exercises that if you do those exercises that you can severely cut the amount of time that it takes for you to get in shape or etc. right? Now, if you now are coming to read this book about learning and it's saying here are some of the tips or tricks that you can do and exercises that you can do that will help you learn faster, you can put that in the what-if level of kind of here are the here's the 80-20. You could put that all under the same type of principle. And if you're trying to learn one specific thing, try to learn it using different mediums in different places. So, for example, when I'm reading these books, what I actually do is I'll read the cover, I'll read the introduction, and I'll read the ending of the book so whatever that is the conclusion usually and then I'll actually go and I'll watch an interview with the author and then I'll read through the rest of the book using speed reading techniques using the author's voice in my head so that I can really feel like I'm learning from the author and that's how I use different mediums in order to learn faster and we'll talk about that actually here in the how I use this section so I'm a very non-linear thinker. So what ended up happening is I really sucked in school, specifically in English. And they always want you to study one thing, one book, one uh, math problem, and etc. Until you know it inside and out. And they have these really long periods of like an hour long. I just can't focus for that long. And it never seemed interesting enough for me, right? So I never got super interested in the things and therefore I didn't work hard enough at them like I needed to. So now what I do is I say, okay, I want to learn about several different topics and here are the topics that I try and listen, I try and learn about and share with you on this channel. About health, about mind and emotions, about business, about relationships, about finances, about social life, about spirituality, all those seven domains of being a fully capable human being. And then I split each one of those topics into a list of books that I think might be interesting, either Someone has given me a recommendation or I've seen recommendations online or even from one book that I really respect in a certain area. Sometimes those books will reference other books and I'll read those as well. And after that, I switch back and forth between topics. So you'll see on this channel, one week it'll be about business, one week it'll be about mind and emotions, one week it'll be about social life, one week it'll be about learning, and etc. I keep switching it back and forth. And the reason that I do that is because... I really, really get bored. If it's linear thinking, I get unexcited. And I love this non-linear thinking where I'm trying to make connections between two bus- two different types of books. So sometimes you'll notice me quoting a health book um, inside of a business book. And this is me attempting to create a framework to think from that's very diverse. Again, this these seven different levels of being a fully capable human being, I try and think of those all as principles and put them so that one principle could work in several different domains and I try and pull if I get a principle from a health book I try and see how would that work for mind and emotions business relationships finances all of those different levels because quite often if it really is a principle it will be applicable to several different levels of being a human being and I think that's very important to know is a lot of the books that you're reading that might be on a specific topic could also be teaching you things about other topics that you just need to look for. You need to make those connections yourself because the author isn't trying to make them for you. So the next part is sleep and naps. And this is an interesting thing to talk about in a book about how we learn. But I think it's important because people don't think about sleep and naps enough when it comes to learning something new. So in the book, Benedict says, napping is sleep too. (laughs) Pretty obvious, it seems. Uh, In a series of experiments over the past decade, Sarah, Sarah Mednick of the University of California, San Diego, has found that naps of an hour to an hour and a half often often contain slow wave, deep sleep, and REM, which is where memory consolidation happens. So it goes on to say in the book that people who study in the morning, whether it's words or pattern recognition games, so those are all things that um, they'll do to test memory, straight retention or comprehension of a deeper structure, do about 30% better on an evening test 
if they've had an hour long nap than if they didn't. So I think this is very interesting. I don't think they really know why memory consolidation happens uh, in sleep, or if they do, at least they didn't talk about it very much in the book. But it's pretty obvious, 30% better just for taking a nap. Isn't that amazing? Uh, And goes on to say here that it's changed the way I work doing these studies, Mendick told me. It's changed the way I live with naps of an hour to an hour and a half. We found in some experiments that you get close to the same benefits in learning consolidation that you would from a full eight-hour night's sleep. That's pretty amazing. And I said here in the mind map, um, they say it's okay to sleep and nap. Need I say more? Seriously. If you're not currently sleeping well or you're afraid to take downtime, you know, naps and, and et cetera, or just even long enough sleep, full eight hours of sleep, some people are, especially in the business world, when you need it, you really are shooting yourself in the foot because human beings aren't built to be workhorses like that. We're built to have rest and relaxation. It's a big part of the process we use to learn and accomplish anything. And I just did a video on the art of learning by Josh Waitzkin. He talks a lot about relaxation and a lot about how relaxation leads to higher performance and better learning. And I really believe that's true. Sleep and naps are huge and relaxation is probably even bigger in terms of relaxation in the moment. So we're all doing things about desirable difficulty. And then we talked about sleep and naps just to uh, quickly switch things up. But we're back to desirable difficulty. And this is one of the desirable difficulties to me that is something that is completely missed. And that's can you teach? And I think this is so easy nowadays that there is really no reason for everyone not to be trying to teach some subject to someone. But I'll move on. I'll get off my soapbox here. She says in the book, many teachers have said that you don't really know a topic until you teach it, until you have to make it clear to someone else. Very interesting. I've heard that many times before, and I think that was one of the main things that inspired me to do these mind maps. Exactly right. One very effective way to think of self-examination is to say, okay, I've studied this stuff, self-examination, as we talked about in the fluency illusion before. Um, Okay, I've studied this stuff. Now, it's time to tell my brothers or spouse or teenage daughter what it all means. If necessary, I write it down from memory as coherently, succinctly, and clearly as I can. So creating a presentation may be similar to these mind maps. Maybe it's similar to the slideshows that I made before. Maybe you're just writing out a couple of paragraphs on a piece of paper. That can be a great way to test yourself. And it's a great way to make sure that you really know it. Think, could I teach this to someone else? And I think Einstein said, if you can't explain it clearly to a five-year-old, then you don't know it well enough. Remember, these apparently simple attempts to communicate what you've learned to yourself or others are not merely a form of self-testing. In the conventional sense, but studying the high-octane kind, right? So it's not just self-testing in the conventional sense, like, oh, do I know this well enough? But even meta, testing is really a form of studying, the high octane kind, 20 to 30% more powerful than if you continued sitting on your butt, staring at that outline. So between all of these different techniques, you're immediately getting some pretty serious increases in your learning and your memory. Better yet, those exercises will dispel the fluency illusion. So if you don't really know it, these exercises will tell you. They'll expose what you don't know, where you're confused and what you've forgotten, and fast. If you can't teach it to someone, then you don't know it well enough. So we'll talk a little bit about teaching. There's an interesting phenomenon where we feel like we really need to know something in order to be able to teach it. While I believe that's true at high level, such as, you know, in schools and business and paid coaching, it's simply not true in life. I don't know too much more about this book than anyone that could have possibly read this book other than I've been doing these mind maps for quite a while, and I understand how to pull out some of the important points from books. But I'm essentially teaching to you. So we learn so much from teaching, from trying to formulate things in our own mind in order to articulate it to people. We learn what we don't know well enough about as well. (laughs) We learn what we don't know enough about as well when we can't 
explain the topic to someone. So if you can't explain some, something to someone, you can't explain a certain part of the mind map to someone, or you can't explain a certain concept that you're learning to someone, you obviously don't know it well enough. And that's why it's important that you go back and you learn a little bit more using some of these other different techniques. And then maybe you try and come back and be a teacher again. So here's how to be a teacher. First, you use the learning techniques that we talked about first. We'd use distributed learning. We'd use this fluency illusion to try and self-test. We'd mix it up. We'd sleep and nap, and we'd try and do normal studying techniques as well, obviously. We'd create some sort of work. For example, you could create one of these mind maps. You could create a th thought structure just in your head, or you could create a presentation. And then you could teach it to someone, anyone who will listen, even if the only person that will listen is you. And I just said here at the end that I, I have remembered so much more from the books that I've taught you than I ever would had I not created these videos. And that's really true. I've read a bunch of books that I didn't do videos on, but the books that I did videos on, I'm constantly quoting in my daily life because I remember them much, much more than the books that I hadn't done these mind maps on. And maybe I had, because I had been doing mind maps a little while before I actually did these videos, I might have even done mind maps on the videos, but or on the books. But had I not done the videos, the videos are really where I learn a lot about the book because it's me trying to distill things down into a very simple and effective way to learn things and then also articulate it, which is using a different side of my brain than I would be if I was just trying to learn it. So this is from the end of the book here where there's a, a q and I think this Q&A was, this question was good, this answer was good specifically for me, but it, it could be for you as well. This is part of maybe the can you teach aspect of, of the book, but th through creative projects, how to learn inside of creative projects or how to use your brain in, in creative projects. So the question was, is there an effective strategy for improving performance on a longer term creative projects? And he says, yes, simply put, start them as early as possible. How many of us are procrastinators out there? Put your hand up and give yourself permission to walk away. Del <clears throat> deliberate interruption is not the same as quitting. On the contrary, stopping work on a big, complicated presentation, term paper, or composing activities, the project <clears throat> or com composition activities activates sorry, the project in your mind. And you'll begin to see and hear all sorts of things in your daily life that are relevant. Oh, this is so huge. I c this, is, this is ginormous. If this is one point from the book, this is it. This is all fodder for your project. It's interruption working in your favor. Though, you do need to return to the desk or drafting table before too long. So you can't wait too long in between your projects, but it is important. This is how I use this right now in my day to day. Because I don't necessarily look, these mind maps are somewhat creative, but they're also quite structured in the way that I pull out the information. But a real creative endeavor that I'm working on right now is my self-coaching course. So creating this course is almost 100% creative. It's a giant creative project that I've put together that I'm trying to create to give to you guys. So creating courses and coaching framework has been much more difficult than I first thought. Absolutely, it was so, so, so difficult. Uh, that's because it's much different muscle than these mind maps. And like I said, the mind maps are more linear thinking, I think. I find the mind maps are better when I try to get them all done in one day. So from reading the book to creating the mind map to making the video, it's much, much better when I actually read the book, do the mind map, and the video all on the same day. It's almost like the ideas are still fresh enough that I'm still excited about them, and that comes across in the videos. And I would say that I probably would remember more if I had spread these mind maps out over the long term. But a big part of what I'm trying to do with these mind maps is to help you guys learn. And I think that a small amount of excitement is very, very important to help you guys learn or else it would just be completely boring. But when creating my course, I have to be much more creative. There are no points or big ideas. It's all coming out of my head and onto the screen and that's essentially 100% creativity. Although I am taking from some of the great books that I've learned from, a lot of it and how I structure it is very creative. So the most powerful thing I've done to drive course growth is to limit myself to only working for one hour a day on the course. And you might be thinking, limiting yourself was the thing that made you grow the fastest in being able to create this course. And that's absolutely the truth. And I'll tell you why. 
the rest of the time I'm either coaching or making these videos or I'm just relaxing and resting like we talked about before. And then what ends up happening is I'll get a revelation about the course. Maybe in the middle of my day, I'm on a walk or I'm talking to someone on a coaching call or I'm making one of these videos. I'll note it down on this piece of paper that I have right beside me. And that revelation will drive an entire hour's worth of work for the next day. And I'll be extremely excited about that revelation and I'll really push hard on making that revelation that I had into a reality on the screen in the course. So then I'll stop after about an hour and until the next revelation, essentially, right? This makes it so I'm not ever just working to work. And a lot of us that are knowledge workers nowadays will show up and will just try and get things done. And I think that's beautiful for things similar to this for the mind maps. I can just show up and get these done. I need to get them done and they're somewhat creative, but they're not overly taxing as far as creativity goes. But something like a course that is that creative, I don't think I could possibly do it if I showed up just working to work, just to show up and pound the keys essentially. That's just not effective for me at least. And when we're talking about creating projects, those need to be inspired. And that's really where the courses are coming from, a place of inspiration. And if you're watching this video, there'll be a link down below for that self-coaching course. I really, really think that this is some of my best work and I'm happy to share it with you guys. Thanks so much for being here with me today on How We Learn by Benedict Carey. And I hope to see you in the next video.